Hello and welcome to this week's program of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Each week we connect with and hear from fascinating and inspirational speakers, often with the message focused on our interests in innovation, entrepreneurship and education. As a Rotary Club, we look for ways these programs might foster new approaches to improving communities near and far. We're glad you, that you've joined us and hope you, you'll enjoy how we're exploring how technology can serve the business of service to others. This week, we have Jonathan Duddles from Greening Australia. But before I um, introduce Jonathan and hand over to him, I'll get our other member, Rustin Hurley, who's on the call to give a brief introduction of himself. Hi, this is Rustin Hurley. Uh, I love getting to hear great messages and I'm really excited about the message from Jonathan. Uh, I'm in San Jose, California. Great, thanks Rustin. And I'm Brett Sham. Uh, I'm a member of the club from Sydney, Australia. So, Jonathan is the Director of Development for Greening Australia and leads a team focused on building relationships <laughs> and securing funds to tackle some of Australia's uh, greatest environmental challenges through government support, philanthropy, corporate partnerships and environmental finance. Jonathan's 25 years experience ranges from business development and fundraising to governance and team leadership in the community, business and local government sectors. Jonathan has previously been the CEO of Greening Australia in Tasmania and Victoria. Prior to Greening Australia, Jonathan was an environmental engineer with an Indigenous organisation in Central Australia and Cape York, uh, focused on community planning, appropriate housing and health infrastructure. He is also currently the chairman of the Tasmanian Youth Orchestra and is Winston Churchill Fellow. Today, Jonathan will be talking to us about Greening Australia uh, and it's working conser conserving and restoring Australia's landscapes. So Greening Australia has um, been going since 1982, and hasn't stopped since. They tackle Australia's biggest environmental challenges with the best science and the best people to return life to landscapes and balance the natural environment and ways that work for communities, economies, and, and, and nature. Uh, from restoring Tasmania as an island art for Australia's most threatened, threatened mammals, to improving the health of the Great Barrier Reef, they work to create healthy, productive landscapes in Australia where people and nature thrive. Today, Jonathan will be talking to us about their efforts uh, and why it's more than just a tree. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Brett. Uh, we're really uh, very pleased to be here. It's, uh, it's, it's really exciting to be uh, engaging with you guys and for, for you guys to be supporting Green Australia. The thing that really has excited um, us in, in recent uh, months is just seeing your international presidents really start to um, yeah, start noticing this issue and start putting out a call to your to your members uh, globally about how important the environment is. And, and I've just got these, started my presentation with these two quotes from, the, from Ian Risley and, and then from, from Barry Rasson. Um, yeah, just really inspiring. And I won't read through those, but you've, you've probably heard those and you can see them. But, you know, to actually, for Rotary to be coming out and saying that, <clears throat> um, you know, we want to make the world a better place, not just here, not just for us, but for everywhere, everyone, and for generations. And that's actually, you know, solving this environmental challenge is, is really core to, to, um, to Rotarians uh, worldwide. So that's, yeah, it's really inspiring. So thank you. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Greening Australia. I've got a video that I won't, uh, that will provide, there's a link to, so you can have a look at that at your leisure um, through our YouTube channel. Uh, let me change slides. Oops, there we go. So, Greening Australia, uh, uh, we're a you know we're a, we're a national organisation for around for in Australia. We're in thirty locations uh, with one hundred and fifty staff, and we believe that people thrive when nature thrives. We have some very big uh, goals for Australian conservation, as you can see on this this screen here. Um, it's to really, uh, we see that Australia has a real opportunity to lead the global conservation effort. And so we've set some very big goals for 2030 and for 2050 for Australia, which includes restoring a vast area of habitat, over 200,000 hectares, uh, storing carbon. We need to uh, extract carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into trees, which do, uh, which do that very well. It's a known technology, um, so we can do that. We're, it's, it's about engaging with landholders. So we do, everything that Green Australia does is working with people um, who 75% you know, of Australia is owned by 
private individuals. So we need to work with those individuals to get access to the land and to work with them to uh, restore landscapes that, that's good for them as well as for the environment. If we've got a target of 3,000 hectares, wetlands and rivers restored across the country, and, and through doing this, we'll conserve at least 20 um, flagship threatened species, both uh, fauna and uh, um, flora species, and mammals and, and birds as well. So just thought this might be useful to show, particularly for your members um, across the Pacific, uh, many people don't realise the scale of Australia and, and, and so this uh, right hand image here is just showing Australia sort of overlaid across the United States of America so you can just see that you know, we're, we're virtually the same size geographically um, with 7% of the population, 7% of the resources to do the work that we need to do. What that means is that there's just a, uh, Australia can play a massive role on the global stage in terms of conservation. And this uh, map on the left shows our footprint, shows where we work. So this, and I'll talk briefly about each of these five programs. Um, but yeah, that sort of shows where we are. We're, 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 our coverage is across the whole of Australia. So the first of these five programs that I'll just um, briefly talk about is Reef Aid. So everybody knows about the Great Barrier Reef and the, and the challenges that the reef is facing, particularly with coral bleaching. Uh, it's a very significant issue and the reef is a global um, asset. Uh, it's a very important um, ecosystem. It's sort of the world's largest um, organism, living organism, and it's under threat. And it's under threat because of climate change, but it's also under threat uh, because of poor water quality coming off the land and landing uh, onto the reef. About 10 million tonnes of sediment, fine sediment, clay soil essentially coming off the land and coating the reef every year. So our role at Greening Australia is to improve that, and what we've taken on as our role is to improve water quality on the Great Barrier Reef and really build eroded gullies and rivers and restore coastal wetlands so that we can prevent this fine sediment landing um, onto the reef and, and, uh, and then allowing the coral to be resilient to climate change. It's a very significant program. Uh, the second of these five programs that I'll talk about is our largest geographic program. So this is Great Southern Landscapes. And as you could see on that previously that size of Australia, this is like a program that would run from you know, uh, California right across to the east coast of, um, of the United States in scale, across the southern part. It's a, uh, unlike uh, the US and Australia, our most productive landscapes is across the southern, uh, productive as for agriculture is across the southern parts of Australia. And this is what this program is focused on. It's basically the food bowl of Australia. And it's the area that's been 85% you know, cleared for agriculture. It's also the area where there's the greatest opportunity to now re-establish <coughs> habitat, re-establish native vegetation, reconnect uh, what's left uh, so that animals uh, can, um, can get across the landscape in the face of climate change. But also it's our opportunity to have Australia's largest carbon sink, which will when complete, will store uh, around 10% of Australia's current CO2 emissions. Thriving on Country uh, is our Indigenous program. So Indigenous people live uh, in all parts of Australia. Um, a lot of people in the north are very in more remote um, parts of Australia, but also in our southern cities as well. And Indigenous people, like a lot of Indigenous people across the world, have been um, dispossessed of their land and have, and have uh, lost a lot of culture uh, and particularly young people you know are struggling to um, find employment and health is not so great and so there's a real you know a real gap between indigenous uh, health and well-being and uh, non-indigenous people in Australia and as there is in many parts of the world so our role here and what Green Australia does is we partner with Aboriginal communities across Australia um, in a, in a much more of a people first program. So people first, environment second. Um, and so this is really a, you know, how, where can we provide opportunities to bring traditional knowledge, uh, which is still there, bring traditional knowledge with um, contemporary science and where that intersects. And then where we can find opportunities working with people to um, help them create uh, enterprise and employment opportunities uh, for their people 
often back on country, not always, but our aim would be to get them, would be to, to work with the people that want to get back on country so they can look after the environment. The environment benefits um, as a result of that. Uh, Tasmania Island Arc, um, particularly for our US audience, you would have heard of the Tassie, Tassie Devil, um, Disney character, Tassie uh, Devil, is only lives now in Tasmania and Australia. It's not found nowhere else on the planet. It used to be um, widespread across southeastern Australia, uh, as did a, a bunch of other um, fauna, such as uh, eastern bettongs and eastern eastern by bandicoots and eastern quolls, beautiful small mammals. But, but these mammals uh, have been decimated on the mainland by foxes by the introduction of um, European foxes. Tasmania, on the other hand, has been fortunate as an island that we've been able to keep foxes out of the state um, and these small mammals have been able to survive. And they are still in decline, so we need to make sure that they, this is the last stronghold. We need to make sure that we uh, create the right habitat for these critically endangered animals to survive in Tasmania. Tasmania is also part of the Great Southern Landscapes program broadly and it's also a part of the, the national carbon sink for Australia. And finally, um, uh, the, the program here that uh, sort of connects with our involvement with you guys is our Nature in Cities program. So which, like in most parts of the world, the uh, you know, majority of the population lives uh, in cities and there's a real opportunity here to create greener, more livable cities across Australia and across the planet, um, particularly with urban growth. Uh, you know, we've really got to be uh, be much smarter about how we design our cities around nature because nature plays such an important role for people's health and well-being um, but also for uh, providing shade and shelter and, and reducing the heat island effect that happens in, in cities with a lot of concrete and not much greenery. So this is uh, a really really key part of our program. It's also where we do a lot of our community education. It's where we're able to really engage with people um, much easier than we can out in the bush, which is often our programs in our rural areas are you know, four or five, six hours drive away from the city, so that's a little bit harder to get people there. So the Cumberland Plains of Western Sydney, so this is uh, an area that we're working on. Cumberland Plains is essentially the Sydney Basin for anybody that's for the first Sydney audience and for people that have been to Sydney. It's, uh, but it's really under, under threat of you know, vast a rapid um, development. Um, Sydney is a very rapidly developing uh, city and this, the Cumberland Plains still contains um, some significant uh, vegetation, habitat and you know, a range of um, amazing species that still exist there in this area such as region honey eaters and other, other small mammals as well and we have a real opportunity to just ensure that these uh, this habitat remains through restoring you know, creek areas, um, you know, urban bushland areas uh, across the Sydney Cumberland Plains. Next steps, um, you know, make a talk to talk to um, each other, talk about how we, how you're going to get involved, um, bring other people along, make the donation. There's a website here uh, for the um, e club. Rotary Air Club of Silicon Valley. And for those of you that are in Sydney or for those of you that want to travel to Sydney from uh, other parts of the world, more than welcome, come along and get involved on the 16th of June. Uh, there's a, have a look at our website for more information or contact Ruby uh, here in our office and she'll be able to help you out as well for more information on the day. So yeah, if there's any, any questions, happy to, happy to take them. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. That was a really great in, informative um, presentation. In terms of, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously here in Sydney as well, but for our um, overseas members and guests, in, in terms of, of the challenges that you've talked about a lot, a lot of those, what have been, you know, the predominant drivers or, or causes of why the, these issues have arisen? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. <clears throat> it's a really good question, Brett. Look, it's, um, it's a combination of things. So it's a combination of... Uh, so some, of, some, of this is, some of these big issues are historic and they're legacy issues. So, uh, you know, overclearing over you know, um, has, I mean, over has occurred and it's still occurring, but 
a lot of the overclearing happened 50, 100, 150 years ago um, through you know, with government support and other support, thinking that this was the right thing to do. And what people didn't realise when they came to Australia was that Australia doesn't have the same environment as you know, what our colonial um, uh, people had in UK, for example. So we just our, our landscapes are not that productive, and they're quite fragile, and it's a very old, fragile landscape. So many of the land farmers that we work with have recognised this now, and they'll say, "Gee, I wish Granddad hadn't cleared that paddock up the back because it's never been, um, it's never been productive. It's never, it's, you know, we're very happy to put it back to nature now because." Um, because we can and because it's not productive and that would be the best use for it. So I think there's a real, uh, you know, while these issues have happened over many years, the, the, the current landholders, current farmers uh, are not the ones that necessarily cause the problem. Maybe their fathers or grandfathers or past governments or whoever sort of encouraged this behaviour, but that's what they thought was the right thing. People have learned to try to change that. And the point here is that we can re-establish uh, this habitat alongside productive farming. So they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, the most, um, the, the least productive parts of the landscape are actually the most productive for biodiversity, typically in Australia. They're the, 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 they're the areas that we actually want to restore. So. Yep. so Jonathan, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the, the kind of the consciousness uh, in Australia related to environmentalism. I, I lived in Australia for a year myself and was always impressed at the, at the focus, right? Um, but, you know, other than, you know, kind of dealing with the di differences between, say, agricultural uh, kind of possibilities between old world and Australia and, and, and seeing the effects of, of that not working as they planned, I'm trying to imagine why the environmental movement has been so strong uh, in, in Australia. You know, I mean, I, I believe the world's first Green Party was there. I mean, it just pe people take this very seriously, and as they should. Uh, but, but what is it about Australia that, that, makes, uh, that makes the people there so ready to be part of environmental, uh, environmental actions and movements and things like this? Yeah, it's a really good, that's a great question, Rushton, actually. And it's, um, I think we're just, Australians love the bush, you know, and Australians do love getting out in nature, and that's what's really special about Australia. We still have a lot of it. Um, I think, you know, if you're, if you're um, most people that come to Australia from Europe or from America, they come to Australia for nature. They don't come here to see our cities, typically. If you're, gonna, if you're, if you're a European and you're interested in cities, you'd stay in Europe. Uh, quite honestly, our cities are good, but they're not like the Europe, you know, historic European cities. They come here to see small animals, they come here to see birds, they come here to see the Great Barrier Reef, they come here to see nature and get out amongst it. And that's, and I think Australians, you know, there wouldn't be many Australians that uh, wouldn't say we um, <clears throat> we want to look, we want to um, get out into the bush on the weekend and go camping, go fishing, and what have you. The, the th probably in some ways Americans are like that as well, do like to get out into the wild as well, but it's a bit more accessible here, I guess, and it's still available. I, I think, um, <clears throat> uh, having said that, the majority of people don't necessarily get out into the bush, but they still want to make sure it's there. They just have this comfort that it is still there even if they don't go out for it themselves. So um, I think the imagery that, that the conservation movement have put through, uh, particularly like when the Greens Party first started, um, you know, some of the imagery of some of the stunning landscapes of Tasmania, for example, just really captured people's hearts and imaginations. And people went, what? Had no idea this stuff was at, at, at risk and, you know, we need to look after it. So I think, and even and with climate change, uh, you know, consistently the, the evidence is that the majority of people you know, are ready, we need to see action on climate change. Um, we just can't continue to um, see a decline in our habitat and in our, in our environment. And, uh, but it's all fixable. That's, this is the really positive part about it, is yes, there's a decline, but we can actually reverse biodiversity decline. We can, re we can actually reverse climate change if we take action now. Um. You know, there's, there's, as we heard at the start, there's a big push for tree planting from, from Papikar and our president, Ian Risley. 
Uh, and, you know, President-elect Barry Rassens also talked about the impact uh, of his, his country from the impacts of climate change and, and, and et cetera. You know, what, what impact does, does planting trees have? So how does it help, help the environment? How does it help combat climate change? So planting trees, it's a really, um, it's quite a simple thing, really. It's quite amazing that planting trees can do so much. I mean, the, the benefits are just enormous. So, you know, they provide oxygen for us for starters. So that's pretty, it's just an essential thing that we need. But they do far more than that. And, and trees, just through their natural processes, store carbon. And, and if you look at the causes of climate change and the causes of CO2 emissions, the, <clears throat> the agricultural sector and the forestry sector and the land clearing that's happened over recent decades is a you know, very, very significant contributor to global CO2 emissions in addition to transportation and, and power generation and those sort of things. So by putting um, nature back and by, by planting trees, we can actually reverse that. We can just take that um, CO2 straight out of the atmosphere and store it back into trees. But the other, so, so, that's, so that's immediate from a carbon, and that's proven. We don't have to wait for any new fancy technologies to store carbon. We've actually got one that's been doing it for, for, for generations. Uh, but then there's just all the other you know, benefits around improving water quality that, that comes when you plant trees uh, and, and vegetation and, and the habitat for the you know, many species that, that uh, also share this planet with us. Right. So in thinking about thinking about that, by the way, I mean, you know, you think about what Rotary clubs do. You know, the idea is to serve the community, uh, serve the local community, serve the global community. And and tree planting outings, you know, like is uh, that makes for a fantastic social and service opportunity for, for groups. Right. You're getting people, you know, that, that chance to get outside, you know, just spend time with each other, you know, with, with, with a very kind of focused, not too physical activity, but but something that, you know, clearly they can be something, it's something they can be proud of going forward. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of our club for, for setting a target of, of, you know, money to be raised to help with, with the effort as well. I think that's, I think that's great. Do, do you find that it's, it's easy to work with groups when you talk about these kinds of activities? <coughs> so you know, if, if what you want is to get, whether it's a service club or a church group or whatever it might be, to, to kind of commit people to making some things happen with planning. Uh, is it something that seems to be kind of an easier sell in a sense than, than many other service act activities? Yeah, look, I think it is. I think it is. And I think people want to get involved. People do want to get, um, get their hands on And as you say, it's a really fun thing to do for families and for kids. And so there's a whole, yeah, a lot of benefits from, from doing it. So just for well-being benefits from being out on the, in, in, the, in the bush uh, helping to do this work. The, the biggest challenge for us having said that is that you know, the is the location of where the majority of the work needs to happen so you know if we're talking about you know 200,000 hectares across australia and many of these sites are you know 3 4 5 hours out of our cities then that becomes a big challenge and so the the, the way we do this is is that the community can play two roles the community can play a role of getting involved in their local community and planting um, trees at local sites that have been identified as being strategic, and that's important. Um, and then, uh, the, you know, the, the, and then the and then providing funds and actually helping to raise money so that we can then have professional crews actually go out into our more remote areas um, that can plant, you know, uh, ten to fifteen thousand trees a day per person because that's what they do for a living, and and that's how we can really scale this up. So it's a mix of both. We actually, yeah, we actually need the funds, uh, in, the investment from community and from government and from, and from corporates and the like to actually contribute towards, yeah, the really big uh, strategic effort and then have more local sort of plantings for people to get out and get their hands dirty. Right. Thanks, Jonathan. So I think um, might wrap it up there. So I'd like to uh, thank you, Jonathan, for your, your presentation today. And like to encourage all of our members and guests who have enjoyed this program to let us know uh, what they think um, below. Uh, below this recording, you'll find our discuss tool for sharing and responding to comments. So please do take a moment to add to the conversation. Um, members and Rotarian guests, please also make sure you fill out the attendance section too. It helps us know about the reach of our efforts and also serves as a makeup for a missed meeting. 
Um, if you put your email address in properly below, you'll get a message you can pass along to your club secretary. Uh, and always, we'd like to give the final word to our speaker. So over to you, Jonathan. Well, look, just, we're just really excited to be, um, to be working with you guys. Really excited that you, you know, that you have taken on this challenge as a, as a group and, and, and it's being led all the way from the top as well with you as international presidents. That's really, it's just really inspiring. I think, you know, looking at the impact that Rotary has had over uh, many years in other causes, in social causes, such as polio, for example, you know, if we can, you know, uh, move as, as some of those issues are solved and then sort of shift some of the effort towards some of these environmental challenges, I think, you know, the, yeah, we can solve these problems quite quickly, actually, with this sort of community effort. So thank you and, uh, yeah, really look forward to uh, doing more. It's great. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us and see you next week.